Alrighty, I'm thinking we have two videos left. Bottom of page 15 with the section that says, how did Quakers in the mid-Atlantic colonies <clears throat> influence New Englanders? So this is going to help with question number one, which is what arguments did some Quakers use to continue owning slaves? Alrighty. The anti-slavery movement grew most quickly in the mid-Atlantic states where Quakers made up a large segment of the population. In the 1750s, Quakers in Pennsylvania and New England addressed the problem of slavery. While sometimes condemning slave ownership, most resolutions they wrote focused on trading in slaves, which some Quakers called man-stealing. Today, we would view both trading and owning slaves as immoral, but many people in this time period distinguished between the two, accepting slave ownership, but denouncing slave trading. I, I, I guess it's, a, it's an evolution. Ideas take time to, um, to, to grow and change. Think of voting rights, right? Okay. Um, the discussions taking place at the meetings had an effect on Quakers and occasionally others in New England. Here is a quote by John Woolman. Suppose a white child falls into the hands of a person who endeavors to keep him a slave. Some men would account him an unjust man in doing so who yet appear easy while many black people of honest lives and good abilities are enslaved. This is owing chiefly to the idea of slavery being connected with the black color. So blaming it on the, the target or the victim. You know, you found yourself in this situation because of your own actions. Well, um, you know, that, that blacks deserved this because of who they are, but doesn't that, wouldn't that still apply to then any person who finds themselves kidnapped and stolen? Alrighty. In 1758, New England Yearly Meeting of Friends, as Quakers were also called, um, Friends is another um, nickname for a Quaker. The Society of Friends is what they called themselves. Okay, in 1758, New England Yearly Meeting of Friends prohibited New England Quakers from engaging in the Atlantic slave trade. The Yearly Meeting in 1773 denounced the ownership of slaves among Quakers as well. So um, it only takes like 20 years before um, trading in slaves is denounced, deemed evil, and then owning slaves is also denounced. The two resolutions represent milestones in the history of the anti-slavery movement in New England, though both directives sometimes fell on deaf ears. Some Quaker masters offered explanations, here's question number nine, for why they needed to retain their slaves. Others noted that they had invested a great deal in the upbringing of enslaved children and that to free them would mean a great financial loss. Another group thought that freeing slaves would result in massive disorder and an increase in crime, arguing that black people could not function as responsible citizens. Okay, so there's a money aspect of it. And then there's this, it's for their own good. Still others argued that it was their duty to assist that their, their slaves as they grew up and that to turn them out onto the streets would be unjust. Quote, he said that she had children that needed the immediate care of a mother and he looked upon it to be his duty to keep her to nurse and bring them up. So this is one person's refusal of why he won't um, free his slave. Um, it's a woman being enslaved, a black woman, and um, this white master needs him, needs her, excuse me, to um, help raise his children. Um, and it's her duty, and it's his duty to keep her. The debate over slavery and slave trading would, would acquire new sharpness, so new focus, 
As the conflict between Great Britain and its American colonies deepened in the 1760s and 70s, as American colonists protested against a British plot to enslave them, a growing number were moved to question the status of enslaved people in their own midst. So big title here, Slavery and the Revolution. Number 10, what new ideas did the revolution bring to people's minds? And you're to name three. The American Declaration of Independence was signed in July 1776, but the roots of the revolution reached back into the 1760s when British officials enacted new regulations on American commerce, mercantile laws, navigation acts. The British hoped to raise revenue to pay off the enormous war debt from the just-completed Seven Years' War with France, also known as the French and Indian War. Colonial merchants um, thought the new regulations were unfair and would destroy their businesses. The resulting protests escalated from open resistance to war and finally to independence for the North American colonies. What British laws did slave trading colonists most di dislike? So we're focusing just on the slave trade. In 1764, Parliament passed the Sugar Act an act that promised to increase enforcement of existing laws prohibiting North American colonists from trading with non-British ports. Rhode Island merchants, who often regularly, if illegally, um, with, traded regularly, if illegally, with the French and Spanish colonies in the Caribbean, were furious. Rhode Island officials sent a letter of protest to England. They noted that less than 20% of the molasses that came to Rhode Island was from British colonies and that the new act would cripple their economy. The letter also noted Rhode Island's dependence on the slave trade. The colonists argued that the new laws would make them unable to pay for the British goods they imported annually and Britain would lose out in the end the colonists' pleas had no effect. Here's um, part of their argument, quote, solely from the prosecution of this trade with the other branches that are pursued in, conquest, in consequence of it arises the ability to pay for such quantities of British goods. Okay, so that's, um, uh, I wish they would have chosen a different quote. But what they're saying is, in the long run, Britain, you too are going to suffer because we will not be able to pay our debts that we owe to British merchants. It's um, this uh, snowball effect. If we can't, if you are going to raise the cost of molasses to us, we won't be able to sell our goods. We won't be able to buy your goods. We won't be able to pay the debts that we owe already. In 1765, the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act, which required colonists to pay taxes on a number of everyday products. Remember that little um, scenario I uh, played with you? Colonists had to buy a stamped piece of paper to prove they had paid the duty, another name for tax, it's also called a tariff. Rhode Islanders began to question their relationship with Great Britain. They insisted that no tax could be imposed on British subjects without the consent of their own represent representatives. To submit to taxation without representation, they argued, re would reduce them to the condition of slaves. How did new ideas about freedom and liberty affect the institution of slavery? Looking back again, um, this will prob um, this will probably tie in better with number ten. As the crisis with Great Britain intensified, colonists were talking about property rights, taxation without representation, freedom, and liberty. Liberty. They spoke about freedom from oppression and about independence. These concepts referred to their relationship with Great Britain, but some colonists saw them as applicable to slavery as well. Some whites in New England suggested that the conflict with Britain was a divine punishment for the colonists, on the colonists for the owning and trading of slaves. They made a direct connection. 
to the situation at hand and the fact that so many colonists had engaged in what was now widely thought of as an unrighteous and ungodly practice. These religiously conservative people believed that God was judging them for their actions. One such individual was Moses Brown of Providence. Remember how um, the Sally basically destroyed their financial uh, well-being for the Brown family? The one-time slave trader, um, and that doesn't mean he just did it one time. It was that he was once a slave trader. The one-time slave trader was converted to the anti-slavery cause in 1773 following the death of his wife. Convinced that her death was a punishment from God, he manumitted. He freed his slaves of his own choice. He wasn't ordered to do that. He manumitted his own slaves. He later converted to Quakerism and became one of the guiding spirits of Rhode Island's growing anti-slavery movement. Here's a quote from another um, slave owner, Samuel Hopkins. He's a Newport minister. Slavery is a sin of crimson, of crimson dye, so red dye, which is most particularly pointed out by the public climatic, uh, um, calamities. Sorry, I had to look at it and then I had to think about how to say it. Uh, the public calamities which have become which have come upon us. So God is um, de- uh, causing people's deaths. God is bringing flood. Um, think of um, oh, think of Moses when he's leading the Israelites out of Egypt, and all of those calamities that um, the locusts that come the and the plagues that are um, that come to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh actually frees them and allows them to leave. Others saw a more practical problem. They feared that slaves in their midst might side with Britain. Some of these colonists began to press for the abolition of slavery, though few could imagine immediate emancipation, so immediate freedom. Some suggested freeing slaves over time or paying masters to free their slaves. So get rid of that financial aspect of it. Colonists' fears about slaves' loyalty later proved right. Thousands of enslaved people, drawn by a promise of freedom, fought with the British during the war. Still others, usually slave owners themselves, saw the property rights arguments advocated by revolutionaries as as applicable to their own situation. To require masters to free their slaves would be, in effect, to deprive them of their personal property. This was exactly what many Americans were trying to keep the Britons, the British from doing. John Brown, Moses' brother, became an outspoken supporter of the rights of colonists to pursue whatever commercial opportunities were at their disposal to make a profit, including trading in slaves. So you've got a, a family dynamic going on there, too, of brothers having completely different political views. As the Revolutionary War loomed, it was unclear what colonists would do. And now I'm going to be at the top of page 18, and um, that will be the final video. Okay, I think we answered questions um, 10, 11, and then 12 will be with the second, uh, the 12, 13, and 14 will be with the final video.